Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm joined by Daryl Ferrucci, special effects and makeup artist, and Fluffy from Creep Show. It's very cool to have you. Hey, Neil. Yeah. Hey, Neil. Thanks so much. Yeah, awesome to be fun. here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I let everyone know you're going to be appearing at Living Dead Weekend, June 14th to the 16th. It's coming up in just three days at Monroeville Mall. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm super excited about it. I mean, it's only my, I can't really count very well, but third or fourth convention, you know, but this one is very special to me because this one is so focused, you know, on two particularly beloved songs, right? One of which, of course, is Creep Show. And that's my that's my thing. I was not part of Dawn of the Dead. But, um, so yeah, super happy to be there. Yeah. And uh, not, not just because you hear this true story, is uh, Creep Show, it's one of my favorite uh, horror movies of all time. It's also the first VHS tape that my mom bought me. And this was when, you know, VHS, they were like 90 bucks probably at the time. And I still have it here on the bookshelf in the in the, in the clamshell case. Yeah. You didn't get the beta? Uh, no, we we did not have beta. We had uh, VHS. <laughs> okay. That was, we would have had was Oh, it right, was. Okay. Okay. They say beta was better quality. Right, but it didn't make it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we didn't but have anyway, it. But anyway, so... Yeah. so I'm just, glad you have that, so... Yeah, there's always something about Creep Show. It's like a great combination of a lot of things. The monsters are, are really fun in it. Uh, the stories, all there's no like bad. Sometimes you have an anthology and there's a bad story or something, but they're all they're all really well made. And I love all the the comic book elements of it with the colors in the background and stuff. Everything about it really appealed to me as a kid. It makes me feel like a kid when I watch it today. Well, the great thing about it, of course, is it was you know. The, the really based on the old EC comics, you know? So it is like a comic book where there would be like maybe five stories, five unrelated stories in one horror book. And there were zombies and there were monsters and there was all this stuff, you know? Um, EC comics were actually before my time. We're talking about like way back in the 50s, right? But yeah. those comics were cool. And that's where uh, Romero and, and Stephen King got their inspiration from to make the film like this. Mm -hmm. yeah um my brother's big comic book collector he he had the reprints of them because they're before his day too mm. but uh but i would read those and uh i always love those and they really capture not even the comic book you know look in the background but like uh especially like the um the um the zombie in the first one uh, uh father's day like it really captures that look of uh of the undead in ec comics right and you know the funny thing about it which i recall from like long ago in childhood reading some of those old comics is there's actually no explanation whatsoever like why does nathan grantham rise from the dead <laughs> right. right like why yeah. right it's like there's no question no he just does right, <laughs> right. Yeah. and suddenly he's there wreaking havoc taking his revenge on the living same thing with um something to tide you over right mm -hmm. how did those people come back from the dead Nobody knows. Nobody questions it. Mm -hmm. But it, it, the lineage is from those old comic books. That yeah. kind of stuff just happened. Yeah. I always kind of like that. I say, I think sometimes when they try to explain something too much, it's not as uh, interesting because there's something about watching something like that and not thinking how it happened or why it happened or filling it in yourself. Like, the, you know, thinking about, well, I wonder right. why, you know, why these guys came back to get the revenge or, well. Uh, Indeed. Why do you want to, why you do you know, like, want to like, take so bad? For example, looking back at The Matrix, I love The Matrix and, you know, most of those movies, and they give a lot of explanation about, like, why this is all happening, right? Mm -hmm. But in Creepshow, no, you don't need to know that. It's just, we're back from the dead, and we're going to take vengeance on you, <laughs> right? Yeah. So so how Pretty did it simple. come How did it come to that you played Fluffy? Were, were you, I assume you were working on the movie... For special effects and makeup yeah it's been a really funny thing you know because um um the first convention i went to i was invited to um by bill fullput um mm -hmm. uh was in 2008 got an email out of the blue will you please come here as a you know celebrity guest you played fluffy the fans are dying to meet you and that surprised me because i will tell you the answer to your question is um 
I basically was just the first assistant to Tom Savini. Um, it was um, my third film with him. Um, it's the most well-known film. And I was just there in the trenches, you know, helping to make the molds and, um, and do the behind-the-scenes stuff, right? And so it came to the point where, okay, we need to make this monster, the crate monster. Okay, so an actor needs to play it. And it was very obvious that um, there were going to be a lot of sitting sessions. Like, we would need to bring an actor in to the barber chair in the studio over and over and over to, like, make a full bust cast and to cast the arms and then to create um, all of the the costume pieces to exactly fit the actor. And so I said, well, why don't I just do it? I'm here all the time, right? <laughs> and that's how it played out. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. So did, um, how did you know Tom Savini? How did you get to work with Tom Savini? It was our third song together. Um, um, I, 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 I want to like curtail, I could go off into like, 30 minutes of unnecessary detail here about <laughs> that whole story. But, um, the basic thing is, um, uh, my father was a gaffer in New York city and I, um, um, joined him in New York city for, after I graduated high school in California. Um, and, and so, um, I worked in the film industry with my dad for a summer. Um, and then he got, hired on a feature film the burning mm, right yeah. and he, he told the producer well look man um my son's here from california for the summer i can't just leave him the producer said well we'll put him on and so um i had uh, at that point i had done some production assistant work and so we went up to buffalo new york and um and then the producer was looking at me at one point <laughs> <laughs> when we got there and said, okay, like, you, all right, uh, go be Savini's assistant. And he pointed to the corner of this upstairs studio. Go be with him. And so I went and introduced myself, and I became Tom Savini's assistant. And then he taught me how to do all this stuff. Yeah. It was a five-week <laughs> shoot. You know, the burning. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> it, was, it was in the midst. But it was just at the waning end of the slasher craze, right? It was a full-on slasher film, right? With the disfigured maniac slashing the hell out of teenagers at a summer camp, right? Um, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, what, what... But, so it was fun. I mean, yeah. Tom, like, taught me how to do all the stuff. And, like, so, um... It, when I when, was... Um, after, I was going to say real quick... Wrapped, here, come on. I'll say real quick when I was a kid, the the burning was, it was it was kind of hard to get. It was like a lot of people had bootleg uh, VHS tapes of it. You know now you can get like Blu-ray copy of it and stuff. But uh, I'm you know it was one that uh, that like friends would have at parties and stuff. Actually, Evil Dead was kind of like that too. It was a little hard to find. Ah uh, yeah, but yeah, but uh, so yeah, it was it was a big movie for for us horror fans when I was uh, a kid in the eighties. The soundtrack was kind of cool, Rick. Oh yeah. <laughs> And the effects, what you were saying? Yeah, I was just saying, you know, it was uh, it was uh, it was a hard to get movie when I was a kid. So hard to get, hard to obtain. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, yeah, right. So did did you like horror movies? I was not explicitly a horror fan at the time, you know, but I fell into it, and I loved the work, and it it was so fun. I mean the stuff you do to make the special effects is so damn fun and it's so cool to see it work on screen, you know? And Tom showed me all this stuff, like, you know, in the burning, how you, like, draw the machete across someone's throat and you have the tubing hidden under the machete and I'm off, off frame, like, pumping a big syringe full of blood so the blood drains down the actress's throat. I mean, I became a fan in that way because it was just so fun to do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you worked with, so you, so you went on to work with them for what on the Prowler then after the burning? Yes, the, the Prowler. It happened 
the next day seriously oh right. <laughs> we we finished shooting um the burning and and then tom informed me hey, i don't know this film that's in cape may new jersey so you're gonna be there right and i'm like yeah and so <laughs> so, so tom took off uh, took off to wherever he had to be and like so my next responsibility was just to get our entire studio we had built packed up and shipped down to this place in Cape May, New Jersey. And I took a train down there um, and started setting up the studio. And so then Tom arrived and we were all ready to go to work on The Prowler, which the original title was Graduation, by the way. Right, yeah. We were here in the, I think uh, it was recently, I don't know if you remember, if you know this, it was recently on uh, Joe Bob Briggs, uh, his- um, Oh, I did his, not his, that. Yeah, they're his return to Shutter. Oh my god, I haven't seen that film in so long. I'd love to see that. I should check that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they have all the back uh, episodes up, so you can also, you know, hear what uh, what uh, what Joe Bob has to say about it. Right, right. So was that a fun time to work on the movies? Because uh, I when I talked to Sam Samini before, he said it was a fun time for him because it was fun to like figure out how to do things as opposed to later on when. There was like, you know, like uh, certain steps that you always did. It was fun to figure out, like, because uh, you were kind of inventing things at the time. Oh my God, hell yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, I mean, this is way before CGI. It was super fun and engaging. I mean, I'd be up all night long, like figuring things out. Like Tom would say, "Like, hey, we have to make the creature face do this," and I'd be in the studio, like all night long messing with small mechanisms and stuff trying to figure out how to do that um it was always like so fun really yeah what was uh joseph zito like on the prowler i have to be honest i don't remember i mean i remember him uh-huh. as a figure i i do not remember interacting with him i mean i was there but you know what it's so long ago there are certain details i forget sure so but, well, when you're, 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 you might need to edit this part out. I don't know because, like, I remember Joe Zito, but I don't remember a single fact about him. To be honest, <laughs> no, it's totally fine. <laughs> yeah, at least you never remember anything bad. So that that's a positive. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. I I don't have any bad memories about yeah. all of this. It was all very great. I mean, there were certain tensions and stuff at times, but I mean, it was all super fun. Yeah, and um really engaging because it was all so hands-on yeah i have not worked in the film industry lately you know but i mean i i realized that there are thousands of people sitting in front of computers um you know manipulating graphics Mm -hmm. um and um i i do that in my current work actually i'm currently like in the field of graphic design and photography and i sit in front of the computer and i manipulate things and it's kind of isolating honestly but back in those days when it was all hands-on and everything was physical and you had to actually make things out of physical stuff it was really engaging and always super fun and challenging yeah i think that comes through in the movies too i think uh you know for me anyway like uh there's a certain fun to that and there's also a weight to that like uh that's out there i think with the cg uh, you can tell like there's something actually there interacting with with the actors. I'm sorry, I didn't really catch that comment. Can you repeat? Yeah, I said uh, I I think uh, not only is it more fun, I think uh, to see like something practical there, but there's also a weight involved that you don't get with the CG that you could tell there's actually something there interacting with the actors as opposed to something that's added in later. A weight, huh? You know, yeah. I feel kind of the opposite. I mean, I feel like. When we were doing the stuff very physically, it was very physically engaging. Like we had to be there on set, manipulating objects and materials. And with CG, it's like thousands of hours of work, and then the result is is is, is rendered on screen. You know, I mean, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it feels real what? different to me. I haven't worked in film during the cg era but um 
I liked it when it was physical. Yeah, I think that's. I think you agreed with me. I was saying I, the weight's not there uh, with CG as opposed when there was like real stuff people interacting with. I think uh, you could you could tell. Oh, right, right, story. right. Yeah, I might have heard the opposite of what you meant. No worries. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think even if you're not aware of of why, there's something that your eye picks up that's not quite right. Well, there may be like. Like for one small example, like you know when um, there's the fantasy scene when Adrian Barbo gets shot in the forehead, right? Right. Yeah. In creature, <laughs> her husband stands up and takes a stand and blows her away in the forehead. Well, you know how he did that? No. Well, um, so Tom had created a forehead appliance for Adrian Barbo. Um, which had a small flat plug in it, which could be pulled out by a monofilament wire. Okay, a, a monofilament, and um, and so I was just off spring with this giant syringe full of fake blood, and so we had a tube like running up Adrian Barbo's body into the appliance to pump blood out of her forehead wound, and so there were no explosives involved. It's just like Tom, I think, probably like yanked the monofilament to pull the plug out, and I pushed the plunger, and the blood flowed out of the bullet wound in the middle of her forehead. Uh huh. That's and, cool. And I mean, you had to like be all together. It's like it's like sports, you know. Like you have to like have coordination and work as a team, right? Yeah. And and that was fun, and it worked, and it was cool. Yeah. What was Adrian like uh, to work with? She was really cool. You know, I, I can't say I am a personal friend of hers. Like we worked together, but like, I didn't like hang out with her a lot, but, <laughs> but, um, um, we worked together very well. And of course I had to like, I had to like, you know, smash her on the forehead with giant monster claws and drag her into a crate and all that, you know, and I can, um, but, um, she was, um, super cool and modest and, and professional. Yeah. And I'll be seeing her again in a couple of days. It's interesting because I haven't seen her since like 1981. Oh, really? So that's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you're in the costume and you're and you're like in the crate or you're uh, under the stairs, like, uh, did you have to hunch down? Was was it like physically hard to, to play uh, the monster? Well, yes, it was. But, you know, I was very young, so I was flexible. Sure. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I was only 17 years old, man. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, it, it it didn't hurt me to like crunch down into these small spaces and everything like that. Um, but like some things hurt. I mean, there were some things that definitely hurt my back and neck and eyes and face. But um, it, it was basically a lot of fun. Like I didn't mind the pain. Like the pain didn't last for long. It was all cool. Um, for example. Um, I had to put the whole, I, I was assisted in, in putting the whole costume on, right? Because there's the whole body part, right? Mm-hmm. And then the arms and then the helmet, it, it basically was a helmet, right? Which we constructed and I was like deeply involved in helping to make the inner mechanisms of the helmet that actually was the monster head right and that was molded to my head and then i had to have um the scleral lenses put in you know scleral lenses right you know what those are the for your eyes yes they're like contact lenses but much much bigger and thicker yeah um, Scleral means it refers to the sclera. The sclera is the whites of your eyes. So a scleral lens covers the entire visible surface of your eye. You know, your iris and pupil plus the entire whites of your eyes and everything. So that thing, it's it's a piece of glass and it's 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 bigger than the entire opening of your natural human eye. And so those things were very uncomfortable. Yeah. That sounds they uncomfortable just hearing me. Yeah. Sounds like what? I said that sounds uncomfortable just uh, hearing it. 
Never mind. Actually, right. I know. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah. And um, like when I had those things in um, for about, say, 15 minutes, I started getting a pretty bad headache. Fortunately, um, there were no takes in which I had to really have those things in for more than 15 or 20 minutes. But um, um, you remember what the monster's eyes look like, right? They're yellow oh, yeah. with a slit pupil, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was no way to do that without scleral lenses. Because imagine if you had a contact lens with a slit pupil, well, it's going to rotate, right? You just put it on the front of your cornea, basically. There's nothing to hold it in place, so it will rotate any way it wants. So we had to have the slit pupil be vertical. So we had to have these scleral lenses, which go deep into your eye socket. And they have kind of a point, not sharp. It was rounded, but like to, to it had a, a pointed part to locate it somewhere inside my eye socket so that the thing wouldn't turn around. And um, yeah. But I didn't mind the discomfort. I mean, it was just part of the job, you know? Yeah, yeah. So how, how did you said about the mouth and stuff? So does someone else work the mouth or are you work in the mouth uh, while you have the suit on? Uh, no, the mouth uh, was directly attached to my chin. Mm -hmm. right? okay. and, and that's part of, part of my job was to assist in like mm -hmm. the building all of that inner stuff. So a picture on um, a fiberglass helmet, basically, um, over my head, and then with a hinged jaw, so the jaw is projecting forward, and just imagine there's no fluffy, no monster, but just fiberglass. Okay, so, so there's this um, fiberglass jaw projecting far out from my natural jaw, but it has a hinge back near my normal jaw hinge, and it's connected to my jaw. So if I open my mouth, Fluffy opens his mouth. Right? Yeah. It's pretty wild. And so, so there was that. And so then, of course, all of the, the entire the creature face, which Tom Savini created, um, and he did all the sculpting and all the makeup and uh, the visual work of what it looks like was all on the outside of that. And there was a lot of other stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> just out of frame too like mm -hmm. like have you seen scenes where like i as fluffy i open my mouth and all this drool comes out right yeah of course yeah. okay so how did that happen well we had tubes <laughs> we had um vinyl tubing going in through the basically the helmet and people with um syringes full of glycerin and so um that that drool was just pure glycerin. <clears throat> That's all it was. Yeah. And um <laughs> and the eyebrows would move um and um the cheeks would puff out, right? Uh-huh. Right. So so um I actually um constructed the mechanisms that made the eyebrows move. They were just like these like resin structures underneath the um mask and face that that Tom Savini created. Um, and it, inside the eyebrows, I put these um, little resin things and attached them to levers, attached to cables, kind of like bicycle cables. And then there was someone with um, a little controller to push and pull those cables. Mm -hmm. And the cheeks could puff out. And those were just bladders. Like, we called them bladders. Uh -huh. uh, we made them out of, like, a substance called smooth on you know smooth on is a form of you know that stuff it's a it's like latex sort of okay. like latex but more sophisticated so we created these little little bladders within the cheeks which could be puffed up with air so then there could be another person off frame like pushing a plunger to puff the cheeks up mm -hmm. and like, it took so many people to control that monster yeah so, like, uh, how, how many, like, takes did you have to do for each scene? How long, I guess, were you in the suit for? Um, not too many, really. I mean, it went pretty well. Um, uh, I don't think we had to do more than three or four takes for any given scene. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but I can tell you about the one time I panicked and fucked things up. Oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, in the very end of the segment where um, <clears throat> Fluffy is throwing into the quarry mm -hmm. underwater, right? Yep. Um, yep. So, um, <clears throat> so, so, um, I had to be um, in a tank underwater dressed up in the full fluffy costume or the head um and the hands um inside the crate okay can you imagine this like oh. <laughs> you're in a tank of water you're in a monster costume <laughs> uh -huh. inside a crate all right yeah. and inside a crate and oh. so all i had to do was punch through the crate you remember that scene it's like yeah yeah when he breaks half a second it. right Mm -hmm. The monster punches through the crate, right? Mm -hmm. And so, fortunately, they had three of those false fronts prepared for me to punch through. Okay. And they were routed out in the box so the cracks would appear. And so, the funny thing is, like, neither I nor anyone else actually gave thought to the idea that, like, okay, this guy, me, Daryl, uh -huh. has never wore a scuba gear before right? right and has no training on it and so 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 picture this i was inside the fluffy mask and there's a lot of space in there and i was wearing scuba gear inside the fluffy tag encasing my head and i was supposed to breathe through the scuba gear and then do the scene um but so here's what happened um First take, I completely panicked. Like my body took over, like my rational mind was disabled. And I swear, my body told me, "You're fucking drowning, dude. You're drowning. Get the hell out of here." <laughs> it's like I didn't know how to breathe underwater. I had no training for this, right? And so I just sort of randomly punched something, and I ruined the first, you know, front of the crate, and probably like stood up or someone picked me up and I was like gasping like ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and I had to I, I then had to learn how to actually use the scuba gear because like you know, I mean, if you're in that situation mm -hmm. enclosed enclosed in three layers, scuba gear, fluffy costume, and a crate and you're underwater, I mean my body just panics. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I would think that'd be a very scary yeah, situation. Well, yeah, I mean, I should have thought of that, honestly. Like, I take it on myself, you know, like, really. I should have said, like, hey, guys, you know, I've never actually used scuba gear before. Can I practice? But it didn't occur to me. But so anyway, the second and maybe third takes were fine. They had three of those things. And, um, you know, the, the crate looks on the front, like Julia Carpenter and all that. So what they had done um, is routed out with a router. They made um, big like channels in the backside of the panels of the crate so that when I punched it, it would break out forward. Um, so it was easy to do, but I totally ruined the first one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, what was George Romero like? Oh. Um, just completely cool, respectful, awesome at all times. You know, I'm, I can't say like, I didn't become close friends with him, but like I worked with him quite a lot and, um, he was just so cool, so modest and awesome, basically. So you also played, um, in the lonely death of a uh, Jordy Verrill. So you play Jordy when he's, a uh, he's completely uh grass, I guess, completely a, a vegetation. Yeah. See, this is just another side project in my main role of um, being Savini's assistant because yeah. I was basically up for anything. And in the previous two lesser known films, I had worked, you know, with Tom on, um, I had done a few stunts here there because like and, and it was just easy and fun and so i was up for it so um when this came up i was like i'll do it 
and there are some interesting stories about it. Yeah. So what what were what were the difficulties in doing that one? Well, um, <clears throat> so um, the art department, you know, um, um, headed as I recall at the time by uh, Cletus Anderson's wife. You know, Cletus Anderson was the production designer, and his wife I forget her name, but she was there. She was involved. She was working, and she um, um, had a clue putting together this giant green costume, right? And it's obviously very tall. Now, um, I'm about like five foot eight. Okay. So that actually worked because, um, um, uh, Jordy Verrill, um, in his overgrown state had to blow his head off with a shotgun, right? Mm -hmm. So, we needed to not have my head right there. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so, so, um, so they made this costume in such a way that my head could stick out the back, really under the shoulder line. Okay. And picture, like, picture the, this giant, very tall costume. And I'm a, you know, moderately short guy. And so, there's a hole in the back of the costume where my head can stick out. And so then um, that place in the set for Jody Verrill's house where um, he leans up against the wall and uses a shotgun. Mm -hmm. So that was a set. That was at Penn Hall Academy in Monroeville where we built all the sets. And so, um, so they cut a wall in that set for my head to go out backwards so my head would be away from the explosion right and so <laughs> it was quite awkward and um it, but they got me in the costume and helped me maneuver to sit down and then stick my head out the back wall of the set right mm -hmm. and so this means if you can picture this um like the, the, the big green overgrown Jordy Verrill, uh -huh. like his shoulders and his head are actually above where my head is. And my head is sticking out the back wall. And there are people back there who I can talk to. Um, and um, so, but I'm holding a shotgun, not loaded, yeah, a prop shotgun. And um, so Savini's there on set um, and he's directing me and he's got his finger on the detonator because the thing is um the head of Jordy Verrill had an explosive charge in it to make it look like his head was going to get blown off right right so I've got the shotgun I can't see anything I'm in the most uncomfortable position I've ever been in my whole life you know <laughs> my head uh. sticking out the back of the wall I can't move at all. There's no way I can move without assistance. And so, but I can feel my arms and I've got the shotgun in my hands and I'm maneuvering it around. I'm saying, okay, a little left, a little right. I get up and then, yeah. And then when the shotgun's pointed right, Tom hits the detonator, which is not for the shotgun, but it blows up the charge inside the, the head of the yeah. costume. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when it goes wow. off, uh, <laughs> when it goes off, is it startling, you know, or is it, or don't you notice it too much because your, your head's behind the wall? Um, I was totally fine, but a really funny thing happened afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard of, <laughs> did you know I caught on fire? I did not know you caught on fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is a really funny thing. So, so I'm totally cool. I'm like, I'm just there. You know, I'm doing my thing and like, ow, my neck hurts, but this will only take 10 minutes. And like, and so we do the thing and I hear the charge go off. No, it's not a problem. The charge is, it's not huge. You know, it's just a small, you know, squib. It's, it's just a, an explosive charge big enough to kind of blow a hole in a fake head. And um, I'm fine. Um, and um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait. I'm going to backtrack a little bit and tell you what happened in the 30 minutes before. Okay, so 
the people who had been preparing the green costume with all this green stuff and like green moss and they were using like like acrylic um um, um caulking material and dyeing it green and spray gluing shit and like putting it all together with lots of um glues and materials and they rushed it down the hill because that was all happening up the hill in the office and they got it on set and i got into it okay so the thing that happened was there were a lot of fresh solvents in the head of that costume, like volatile, flammable <laughs> solvents. Uh-huh. And um, um, when that charge blew off, the whole thing, the, the head caught fire. Not a lot, but a little bit. You know, it, it did catch on fire. Okay. And um, I didn't know because my head was on the other side of the wall. <laughs> um, and so like we did the scene and everything and then like the producer David somebody like he you know came to meet me um, and he said you're all right and I said I'm fine and he said let's take a walk and like we walked like down the street a little bit and he said we're doubling your pay because the thing is like I did I, I got paid extra for these various side things I did right Mm-hmm. I mean, I had a basic pay rate for being Tom Sweeney's assistant. And uh, when I volunteered for these various other things, I'd say, okay, we'll pay you this much for that. And he said, I'm doubling it. And I said, okay, cool. Why? And he said, well, because, you know, of the fire. Because my head caught on fire. The head of Jordy Verrill uh-huh. had caught on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so here's your bonus, right? The fire bonus. <laughs> I never knew. I did not know. I mean, of course, you know, there's a ton of crew people around and they could put the fire out immediately. But, <laughs> but yes, it caught on fire while I was completely immobilized and trapped with my head sticking through a hole in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was funny. Anyway, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's a long time ago. I mean, why did I get paid for a thing like this? I don't know. A few hundred dollars. No, I don't know. I'll give you twice that. And yeah. I said, okay, thanks. <laughs> I look <Right>. fine. <laughs> so, so after after you do a creep show, um, when, when, do you always realize that people you know love creep show and has a following, or is it not till uh, you get the email from uh, from Bill Philfoot to do the convention that you know like this is something that people still you know really love? Well, in that first email from Bill was back in two thousand eight, and uh, that was the thing that really tipped me off that people still have so much adoration for this. Um, and, but since that time, that's 11 years ago. Yeah. And I've learned and really appreciated that, um, it's amazing how much staying power this film has. And so, so many fans and how, how people still love it so much. I mean, every single time I go to a convention and, um, I'm also absolutely looking forward to, you know, the upcoming one, mm-hmm. the Living Dead Weekend is going to be amazing because it's focused on Creep Show and obviously Dawn of the Dead. So um, I, um, I've had great times at the previous one, but I wonder if I'll be mobbed at this one because it's <laughs> dedicated. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I think that you don't. Know... dedicated to Creep Show. Yeah, and I think they have, you know, their uh, their regular following that goes every year. Uh, anyway, and they're all, you know, the whole weekend started, you know, as a, a tribute to Romero movies. So it's going to be, well, yeah, you know, all people that love, uh, you know, all these movies. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a, a wild time. Well, but yeah, so to, to return to your question, actually, I have been amazed at the um, continuing following for Deep Show. And at every convention I've been to, people come up to me and say things like, okay, this is an actual quote. Oh my God, I've been dying to meet you. You scared the shit out of me when I was eight years old. <laughs> okay. And I've heard quotes like that like 20 times, oh. really. <laughs> and fans are so thrilled to meet me. And to be honest, it's a little funny to me because like, I'm just the guy in the suit, you know? But, um... Uh, I'm happy to be there. Yeah, of course you should be, and it's a it's a very memorable monster, and it's uh, 
it's cool that uh, with the internet now you have uh, credit for being the guy in the fluffy suit. Was it always called fluffy, by the way? Well, yes. Yes, it was always called Fluffy. And uh, I can tell you who made that name up. Her name was Debbie Pinthus. Okay. Debbie Pinthus was um, a production assistant on the film. And she ended up uh, more or less exclusively hooking up with the uh, Roach Wranglers. Okay. Because she loved bugs. And um, she was a super cool girl. I could, I could go off for half an hour on the whole bug thing, you know. There's a lot to tell about that. But anyway, it was Debbie who named the creature Fluffy um, on set during the making of the song. And so, like, because we, we were going to call it something, right? Mm-hmm. And so she said Fluffy. And then later, uh, probably through Fangoria Magazine, mm-hmm. that name came out. Like, like probably the next year. Mm-hmm. And so fans learned that a monster is called Fluffy, right? But so... <laughs> That's that's where it came from, Debbie Pinthus. Yeah. So did you you worked on all the, all the uh, stories and creep show even you know not the ones that you necessarily were um on. Oh yeah, yeah. I was fully there for everything. Yeah. I mean, like I was with Tom. I was um Tom's assistant. But I mean, I made friends with everyone, like the the art department, um, who made all the green stuff, which is a huge job. Yeah. Huge job making all that green stuff and. They were friends of mine, actually, um, from New York City. I was actually based in New York City at the time, uh, but um, I went and lived in, in, in Pittsburgh for seven months. Um, and um, But I had a couple guys I knew already um, from New York City who joined the green department, as we called it. And like, this one night, these guys called me up. They were out at the farm. Like, I can't remember exactly where it is. It wasn't very far away, but, you know, Jordy's farm. They were out there. They call me up. They say, Daryl, Daryl, we need help. We got way too much green stuff to do. Can you come help us? I went out there, and I stayed up with them all night long, <laughs> gluing green tendrils to stuff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it was quite a scene. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, so, uh, the, the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the, the, the bug, the bug one, um, uh, what was that like to work with all the cockroaches, all the bugs? Oh, well, it was great. I mean, I don't mind bugs, you know, uh-huh. um, um, and again, like I work with everyone, um, like for example, let's picture the scene, you know, the, um, the, the ultimate scene in that story where the guy is lying on his bed, apparently dead, and then his chest starts kind of bubbling, right? Mm-hmm. And roaches burst out of his chest, yeah. and then roaches burst out of his mouth, right? Yeah. You picturing that? Oh, yeah. So, I so, so, so here's how we did that. Okay, so um, Tom had made that, you know, basically corpse, you know, of the bastard E.G. Crichton. What, what's his name? What's his character again? It's that E.G. Marshall. The guy. Yeah. E.G. E. G. Marshall. Yeah. But his, his character is, um, Upton Pratt. Bastard, Upton the, Pratt. Yeah. Upton Pratt. This is Upton the, Pratt. The, yeah. <laughs> the dastardly bastard who, like, basically everybody wanted him to die, right? Right. Like, screw Upton Pratt. So, so he finally does. And so when he, when we see what happens to him, he's lying on his bed, all right? And so what we've got is, the it's all a set in Penn Hall Academy in Monroe. And um, <clears throat> so under the bed, there are two gargantuan, basically plexiglass cylinders. Like imagine a four-inch wide plexiglass cylinder with a big plunger. Okay. Um, and then another like three inch wide plexiglass cylinder with a plunger, just like a big syringe. And now what we did is um we um knocked out all these cockroaches, which you do with carbon dioxide. You just like throw the cockroaches into a bin or something and you 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 you, you to put a bunch of carbon dioxide in there, which knocks them out. Um, for lack of oxygen, 
And then we pack them into these big cylinders and wait for them to wake up, all right? And so we got <laughs> these two cylinders. The four inch one is attached to the place where it's going to come out his chest. And Tom Savini had made all this makeup using like a tissue paper like material over the chest with makeup, which is easily broken through. And Tom like made the whole face of Upton Pratt. And so under the head uh, was this three inch cylinder. And I was manning that one. And these big cylinders it, it are all filled with cockroaches. Mm -hmm. Is this making sense? Can yeah, you picture this? I can under, yeah. Okay, right. Good. So, yep. so there's like probably it was Debbie under there with the big one or somebody. And like I had the small one. Um, and we're just like waiting for action, right? I'm cramped under the fucking bed, holding the handle of a giant cockpit syringe. They say action. And we start gently shoving the plungers upwards, which force all of the cockroaches out of his chest and mouth. And uh -huh. that's how that went. Yeah. Well, um, when they used to show uh, Creep Show by uh, here, not before, not on cable, but like on TV and Channel Thirty Eight here, uh, they used to always cut that segment out. And I used to think really? because, yeah, I used to think it was what? because I, I I didn't know why, but I found out later oh, it was because they wanted to cut the movie down to two hour time limit with the ads, and they had to cut a segment out, and for some reason that was the one they used to cut out. But uh, oh, okay, but it, well. I suppose a shame. Was, uh... Well, that's unfortunate. We put a lot of work into that, let me tell you. I mean, that was, yeah, yeah I mean, that was a lot of work. Come on. We yeah, had to exactly. deal with a lot of big bugs. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, my brother, which probably a lot of people had this book, but when I was a kid, my brother bought me as a Tom Savini book on how to do effects. It had some stuff. Oh, in the it. original one? What was it called? The, what, the, 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 I right, saw the tip of my tongue. What is it? I'm not positive what it was called. That's not the, the, okay. His first it, book, right? Uh, it, well, it had stuff from the the Creep Show in it, so I I, I don't know if that. Yes. Was. Yes. Okay. And uh, two yeah. things that stick out in my mind was uh, one that they used Rice Krispies on um on the on the on the uh, on the father when he comes back for Father's Day, and another one is that it was mm -hmm. a real corpse in the window. In the in the opening scene, with, when the kids reading the comic book. Well, I mean, um, I spent many many hours working on that thing, building the internals, and yes, we used a real human skull, right? Yes, and, still, and yeah. a, a human skeleton, yes. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, if you want to call that a real corpse, okay, the stag, mean, yeah, it is different than a skeleton. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes it seem like you would have no. found someone. <laughs> Dug somebody up or something. Yeah, it's a little different. You can actually order a human skeleton online. Okay, even back then. Well, back then, not online, but um, mm -hmm. yes, it was a human skeleton, and I spent many, many hours with a Dremel tool, you know, working on it. And um, I know the unique smell of burning human bone. You know, <laughs> I mean, when you hear it, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I I can't describe it. It's difficult to describe a smell, but um, yeah. Yeah, that was a real skull that we so, used, so and 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 real human bones. So, what what is that experience like? I guess when you're working with a human, do, do you think about that, or is it just this is you know this material that I'm using? Um, it's a tough one. Okay, um, tough one. I mean, I did at times. You know, I thought about like, okay, this was a person's head you know and there were thoughts and there was a brain in here but frankly i i, I couldn't get too distracted by that i mean i had a right. job to do you know so um but yeah i was not unaffected but i mean i wasn't creeped out i mean yeah it's like thousands of people die every day so mm -hmm. here's a remnant of one of those people I mean, I hope they were not murdered in order to provide a skull, but that's unlikely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, there is a there is a story about that because, um, because I guess where you used to be able to buy the skeletons were from India, and then yes, like right. then there, yes. there was like a rumor that they were like 
harvesting them to sell you know that is true and i've heard of that yeah now i didn't know that at the time at all sure i i i've heard of that in you know decades since but um i wasn't aware of that at the time so it could be possible yeah is it and i, I think they even put it in the in the script i believe for return of living dead is he he talks mm. about that that he makes like a joke about and then a they say that, like, then after that movie came out is when they stopped uh, doing the sales from India, which uh, people think that, oh, maybe they heard about it and then they stopped it. But it's a, uh, who knows? Uh, it's interesting. Well, you know what? I think that probably doesn't do any humanitarian good because you can probably get anything you want from China. <laughs> That's very true. I, I'm just guessing. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So, uh, uh, any stories from working on Father's Day with uh, John Amplis as uh, as Nathan uh, Nathan's corpse? Well, I I I, I love John Amplis. You know, I consider him a great friend, um, and um, we have um, often been seated together at conventions, and I always enjoy that because he's a super cool guy. And he's got a background in actual theater. You know, I mean, decades of experience teaching and performing in a theater in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, plus, he's a really cool guy. So, um, I hope I'll be seated near him in this upcoming um, uh, convention. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, he'll Living be Dead. there. Mm -hmm. He will be there at Living Dead Weekend, and, um, and I hope to be near him. Um, yeah. He's a really cool guy. I think he might be I don't know, near retirement, maybe? But, um, um, so I gotta tell you, okay, so, um, um, Tom and I were discussing, like, okay, Nathan Grant, Tom, all right, so, the decayed skeleton of Nathan Grant, Tom comes up out of the grave, you know, the grave, and, and I, I was thinking, um, okay, so, the decayed skeleton of Nathan Grant, Tom comes up out of the grave, and I was thinking, I can do that. And <laughs> like Tom was saying, like, okay, we need a thin guy, right? We need a thin guy because we're going to make a skeleton costume on top of him. So obviously he needs to be thin. And I'm like, I'm thin. Mm -hmm. And um, and then um, they hired John. And it's like, oh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, there was a little bit of that oh, moment. Like, I could have yeah. done that, uh -huh. right? But, um, uh -huh. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, you know, it makes sense because obviously um, John Amplis has a lineage with Romero's songs. And so he ought to be hired, right? Let's give the guy a role, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. He's in pretty yeah. much like, all, all the original ones, too. Yeah. Right, right. So, so the role should go to him. And I didn't push it at all. I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything at all. I, it was just private thinking. I could do that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but um, <laughs> but so he did it, and so we had him in there, you know. And it's a huge process, man, to prepare an actor for a role like that. I mean, it was the same thing we had to do with me. You have to make a full cast of his his head and shoulders and torso and arms, like like days of work making these molds and all this stuff. Um. And then once we have all the casts prepared, then Tom Savini would would sit there for many hours and sculpt the the you know all the the the, the, the features of the creature involved on top of the cast of the actor. So it would stick the actor. So um so that's what happened. And um yeah. I'm glad he got the role. Yeah. No, yeah. he's very good in it, and so one of, one of my two favorites. Well, actually, they're all like I love them all, but uh, was, ever since I was a kid, it was always a toss up between the crate and Father's Day. But uh, uh -huh. yeah, either. but uh, oh, Father's Day is pretty funny. Yeah, I think in terms of comedy, uh -huh. right? And for comedy, I think Father's Day is the funniest one, isn't it? Yeah, it's really funny. I guess uh, you know, uh, the lonely death of Jordy is pretty funny too. Except for the end, is very, it's very, very funny. But it's, yeah, yeah, there's a serious depressive feeling. It's 
really horrible. I mean, that poor guy, poor Jordy. I mean, my God, it's it's really depressing. But but they they do make it so funny, especially all those scenes with his father figure, right? Yeah, yeah. He shows up like four or five times, and and then eventually, in the mirror, you realize, oh, that's Jordy's dad, right? Yeah, yeah. right. And that's uh-huh. Stephen King's genius, right there. That's the thing Stephen King did. Is he put that all together. Right? Yeah. Was he ever on? Well, and obviously he was on set, I guess, because he said the movie. He was constantly around. He was totally around all the time. And like being like with Tom in the special effects studio, it was like special. Like it was a special place. Like everyone knew that our place was special, right? Special effects is not just a term. It was like it's the place to be. And so, um. Yeah, Stephen King would frequently come around and pal around with Tom. And, like, I met Stephen King on numerous times. And um, at the time, he had he had gotten this, like, little uh, Mercedes sports car. It was kind of a new thing for him. And, like, so he took Tom and me cruising around up the streets, the windy streets of Monroeville, and his little Mercedes sports car. And... Um, my impression of Stephen King was he was just like a really fun guy and he seemed like, I don't want to be disrespectful. Mm-hmm. Um, he seemed like a big, happy, overgrown 13 year old. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, because he was like, just such a fun, like kid. Uh-huh. Basically he was like a fun guy having fun. I mean, he was lots of fun. Yeah. Like I actually really liked him and he was always really friendly and avid and he would come around because it was so fun to see what um was happening in Tom's, you know, um special effects studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you everybody have, did you have, liked to come around? Yeah, do you have any memories of his son Joe King who was, you know, uh in the in the wraparound segments? Yeah, not much. I mean, I know that's that's his son. Yeah. I, I, I honestly don't recall if I personally met him, um, mm-hmm. but um, so I would say not really. Yeah. <laughs> when I talked to Tom Atkins, he told me that, that Steven told him to really slap the kid, which I don't know if he really did or not, but I was like, huh, that's interesting. It, it was funny when he told me. I do not know that because I did <laughs> not witness that scene. All right. Okay, fair enough. So uh, how about uh, something to tide you over? And, uh, you know, that's before Leslie Nielsen's really known for, like, uh, comedic roles, but he's hilarious in uh, something to tide you over. Like Airplane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And still hilarious. Mm-hmm. Surely hilarious. <laughs> Let's go, what about it? Uh, do you have any uh, memories of working on that? And uh, the, I guess the effects for uh, for the zombies coming back. Yeah, I guess they're zombies. Well, um, nothing with Leslie Nielsen in specifically you know because like i wasn't on set for a lot of that but i mean i was i spent hours and hours and hours just in the basic assistant role for tom we had to make those horrible like seaweed you know drowned zombie faces for those people and we had to make bullet wounds for them and all that um i think that um my story my stories like like are like probably pretty boring and would consist of many many hours of mold making and uh, you know <laughs> blood tubing and stuff yeah like that. Uh, um they do have a great waterlogged feel to them unlike uh, any other zombie i can remember from a movie they certainly do you would wonder how they got so waterlogged i mean it was only like overnight <laughs> right but, right yeah um, but anyway it's like the ec comics genre so that's what Stephen King and Romero were riffing on to make this. So they're just ramping up the horror, you know. Mm-hmm. Have you ever thought... read any of those old comics? Oh yeah, yeah. Like I, I said, my to... uh, yeah, my brother had the reprints. I... Then... I'm sorry. Go on. I haven't seen any, any of those comics in like thirty years, but mm-hmm. I've got some tucked away somewhere, and like. And they're fun, and I understood the origins of these sorts of things coming out of this comic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the uh, our old our original website, all the guests were made into like EC style comic books, but we didn't do the show every week, so it was it 
when we started doing the show weekly, it was hard for my brother to draw caricatures of every guest every week. So we kind of abandoned that. But I still have a whole bunch of them from the uh, from the original website. Oh yeah, yeah, so it was very fun. But yeah, I love those. And then they put out the they put out like hardcover uh, reprints of like of yeah. I think there's like three volumes or something of. Uh, oh, um, I've seen some of those. Yeah, they're nice. I all of them. That out again. Yeah. yeah, all of them are good. You know, because there's the there's like th- two or three of the horror ones, and then there's also science fiction ones and crime ones. And uh, I'm more of a right. horror guy, but uh, I think they're all fun. So Neil, mm-hmm. Neil, are you going to be at the Living Dead weekend? Unfortunately, I will not be because I have uh, a movie premiere this Saturday of my uh, short film about me. It's a short documentary about me at uh, in Boston oh. this year, and so I'll be at that. But I uh, I will be at one down the road because uh, I'm friends with oh, Florence. Cool. Friends with Florence, I know him from many conventions, and we hung out together. I got him in trouble once with his wife because I kept him out all night. But uh, I would love to go to uh, to uh, a Living uh, Dead weekend. I have a Living Dead weekend show. Oh. Well, it's too bad you won't be at this one because it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to Living Dead Weekend. Yeah, yeah, it's it's packed and it's cool because it's actually my two favorite Romero movies. It's uh, Creep Show and Dawn of the Dead. For me, Dawn of the Dead's the best zombie movie ever made. So it's uh, it's my two favorites. So it's uh, it's perfect. Yeah, it's going to be a great scene, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, loaded uh, loaded lineup. Uh, People should check it out. And I've heard nothing but good things about previous ones. And it seems to really get bigger every year. It's so interesting that the Living Dead Weekend is going to be taking place in the actual Monroeville. Yes. Yeah, that is very cool. I've never been there. Oh, yeah. I have. I'm looking forward to going up on the roof. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can escape in a helicopter. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So when, when did you stop uh, working in film? And was there any reason? Well, my entry into the film industry was actually kind of accidental. I mean, my dad was a gaffer in New York City. I graduated from high school in Santa Cruz, California, but I was born in New York City. So I went back to rejoin my dad okay. for the summer. Mm-hmm. And... um that's when my dad got hired on the burning <laughs> and um since he wasn't gonna leave me in new york city he told the producer i got my son and the producer said we'll hire him and that's how i worked on the burning and that's how i met tom savini um <laughs> so my original plan was just to go back to california and go to college after the summer mm-hmm. okay so here's what happened like five years later after working in like four or five horror films with tom savini right i had been in the film industry at some point i was sitting there in new york city thinking wait i meant to go to college you know and so um i actually did i left the film industry and i moved back to california and I went to college and eventually I just, you know, got into the art department and uh, became a photography major and, you know, basically became a photographer and got into my personal artwork. Mm-hmm. Um, now that has not been profitable. And sometimes, sometimes I think to myself, like, why didn't I just stay in film? That was so fun. And I made money, but, you know, um, I did what I did. <clears throat> that was many years ago, and I've been out here in Santa Cruz, California, ever since. Yeah. Well, what kind of uh, what kind of art do you do? What kind of art do you work on? Well, primarily photography. I've done a lot. I've done um, sort of avant-garde for performance art. I've, uh, I've made sculpture. Um, I've been kind of quiet for a while and just kind of quietly take photos. Um, I don't make money off my art. Um, I do it for my own satisfaction and it's been like that for a while. Yeah. Well, I think our, our probably is, you know, something personal, so that makes sense. 
Well, yeah, it is. So, um, w- with the horror movies, um, do you ever do you ever go back and watch any of them? Occasionally, yeah, yeah. Um, I had a fabulous opportunity to see Creep Show in a theater, the Alamo Draft House in San Francisco. Oh, nice. Uh, Thirty-five millimeter print on the big screen, and I have not seen Creep Show on the big screen since sometime in the early '80s. That was awesome. Um, uh, at other times, I just kind of sit around and watch stuff on Netflix, you know. Yeah, yeah. There is something because spe- uh, I have some uh, theaters here in Boston that you know show original thirty-five millimeter uh, screenings, and even if it's a movie I've seen before, there's something special about watching it on the big screen and you know how it's meant to be. Yeah, seen. there is. Yeah, yeah. It's a great time. I had a great time just like a month and a half ago up at the Alamo Draft House, mm-hmm. seeing Creep Show on thirty-five millimeter. And they had a nice print too. <clears throat> Yeah, so that's the only problem. So, sometimes with certain movies, it can, it can add to it the kind of graininess, or but uh, with Creep Show, I think is better if it, you know if it's it's a it's a nice print and you can see it well. Well, there were some scratches and specks, yeah. you know, but I mean, yeah. it looked good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I remember, and I was with a good crowd. Yeah, that that really adds to it too. If you're with uh, pe- you know people who who obviously love them, they probably wouldn't go. If they didn't love the movie. And uh, if everyone's having a good time, you you know, it's a, just a good atmosphere and it's a good, like, community event. It really was. I actually was invited as a guest. So right, sure. um, the host took me up on stage after the film, you know, to, for a and a and that was pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would assume so. Did you did you uh, keep anything from any of the movies or did you not think about it? Yeah, that? yeah, oh, you did. Cool. it's all gone now. Man. Oh, okay. It's all gone. I mean... So many years ago, so many years. I mean, I had some really amazing things, like the original concrete cast of my head and shoulders, which was made to create the fluffy fiberglass helmet on. Mm -hmm. I had that, but it seems that my father's nasty Mm ex-wife threw it away several years ago. Yeah. Um, I had the original hand. The oh, actual wow. like, foam latex with the, the yak hair. That was yak hair. Uh, like uh-huh. the, the full on hands and claws and everything. Um, I have no idea what happened to them. Yeah. And then, you know what? I moved out of New York City in around 1993 and I had a yard sale. Mm-hmm. I sold stuff you wouldn't believe. Like, well, I sold my motorcycle. I sold some of my extra cameras. Um, I sold the, <laughs> some extra neck wound appliances <laughs> from Father's Day. Uh-huh. <laughs> With bloody wounds on them. I don't know what these people thought they were buying. They probably <laughs> sold it for like five bucks. You know? Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> on the street, on East 10th Street in uh, Manhattan. <laughs> I bet well, Lawrence wishes he would have been at the uh, at those uh, at the I art sales. He would have been quite the like three years old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's yeah. He probably didn't have any money. No, <laughs> no. he's he's probably starting to watch Creep Show at that time. though. I think he's. <sighs> yeah, the other thing I had like like we we made um like a preservation mold of the basic fluffy head in red RTV rubber, right. Like we made it for safety, um, you know, RTD, right? It, yeah, yeah. Whatever the hell it is, it's this red, like probably silicon rubber. Um, I had the entire face of fluffy and red silicon rubber out of the original mold, and uh, that again is just gone. I don't know where it is. Yeah, probably in some dump somewhere. Uh, let's see. So, so years later, now there's like merchandise with uh, Creep Show on. There's you know crate T-shirts and there's pins and yes. Yes, action sir. figures. And uh, what's that like yes. for you to, to to see? You know, the, the, this stuff with the uh, amusing. Art. It's mm-hmm. amusing. I love it. Um, like one of the last conventions I went to, which was a few years ago, I got this great T-shirt from uh, what's the company? 
um oh man there's a couple mm-hmm. um apparently running a company um oh i wish i could remember the name but they made a t-shirt uh, is it a, is it atomic cotton no okay um it's um it, i had a black t-shirt from them with a primarily blue uh with red and white a great fluffy face on it and it was fluffy huge fluffy face very well illustrated and um that was awesome i mean i wore that like every day at that convention i didn't even wash it you know um 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 oh i'm trying to remember the name of the company but um i'd like another one of those because i don't know where i put it um i love the merchandise in fact but you know what I'm not going to wear t-shirts like that. Um, Just a nerd. At the, um, <laughs> at the upcoming convention. Um, mm-hmm. I think I'm going to wear my dad's shirts. I'm going to, I'm going to dress more uh, fancy, like not fancy, but um, I don't think I'll be wearing t-shirts. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Uh, my dad died like two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. And, um, that was in New York City, where I was born, and so I went back there, came back with a, some of his better tools and some of his excellent shirts. Well, what kind of movies did he work on? Oh, my dad was a gaffer. He was a union man in New York City for like 50 years, okay? Uh-huh. And he worked primarily on commercials and videos, but, you know, occasionally on films. He... um often picked up a lot of work to uh, Saturday Night Live, you know, because they do, yeah. they go out and do things sometimes, so like he was hooked up with them, he worked on, what's that fucking cop show down at, you know, old school New York City cop show centered around uh, somewhere downtown where the cop places, and I don't know, man, I don't actually follow the film world all that much. Right, no problem. Um, but um, he was a he was a seminal figure in the film union in New York City for many years, and um, so he brought me in. Yeah. So I do have a question because yeah. because you're from New York. Uh, when you worked on Chud, uh, what yeah. was it like actually fil- actually filming in the city? Because I've had people on the sh- on the show from Chud, and they said it was. Uh, I don't know if dangerous, but there was some like grubby places that like uh, they filmed some scenes that. Oh, it didn't matter to me at all. I mean, I lived in the sure. neighborhood basically. I mean, our our filming was um, in downtown Manhattan, and I lived in downtown Manhattan. Mm-hmm. I mean, I lived on East Tenth Street between A and B at the time, so um, um, it was great. It was awesome. We had the most incredible locations I've ever been to. Okay, like, we had locations under the Manhattan side of the Brooklyn Bridge. Okay, and so that is normally completely sealed off. Are, are you familiar with New York? No, you... not not too, not too. Okay. I've been there okay. a couple okay. times. So, so yeah, you know what the Brooklyn Bridge looks like from, like, sure. touristy photographs, right? Yeah. Okay, so, but, I mean, huge and it has a, a, a massive rock landing you know on manhattan and there are doors in there that nobody goes into and if you can get in there there are catacombs under under there and we filmed all this stuff for chud in the places underneath underground under the manhattan the landing of the Brooklyn Bridge, which is an amazing place. And you go in there and you can like see down, like you can look down like, like 150 feet, like down and kind of sideways. Um, you can see, oh, there's this subway station down there. And you can actually look at people walking along on the subway platforms and trains going by. I mean, the underground scenario of Manhattan is incredible and complex and so we were down there and so i was actually enjoying that more than anything else involved with filming the movie you know yeah. you know what i did on chud uh, no not really i'll tell you what my job was yeah i i designed and created 
the Geiger counters. That's what I did. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. You know, so these guys are like wandering around with these little sort of like white L shaped things, right? Uh -huh. Little units, right? Yeah. With a sort of coil, like a phone cord sort of thing and a wand, right? Uh huh. Do you remember? Yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and the, um, so the Geiger counter things have a LED display that goes up and down depending on what they're reading. I made those things. I designed and created those things. That's what I did. <laughs> and, and it was ridiculous. It was a ridiculous process. But <laughs> it's kind of a ridiculous movie, to be honest. But, uh, but, but it's a very ridiculous movie. And I was involved. Also, friends of mine who were also in Creep Show were with me on that film and they were in the art department and so they got me hired on that one and I did the fucking Geiger counters and like so you know the chugs have glowing eyes? Yes. Yes. They do. Uh -huh. Okay. So those were ping pong balls. <laughs> they were they were cut out halves of ping pong balls sprayed with a substance called Scotch light. Scotch light. It's, it's a it's a spray which sprays like reflective beams <laughs> it's, it's 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 a material where if you spray it it's like a spray paint which is highly reflective if you point a light directly at it okay uh -huh. that's what that was and so we sprayed the ping pong balls with scotch light and put them onto the Chud's eyes and um, then you had to, besides all the normal lighting that you have for the scene what you need is um, a light directly in line with the camera like you need light pointing in the same exact direction that the lens is pointing mm -hmm. now and that will cause the scotch light to glow intensely it's the exact same thing if consider you're driving down the highway in your car, right? You've got your headlights on. It's at night. You see a street sign and the letters glow, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Does this make sense? Yeah, I'm understanding. Yep. Right. It's the same thing. That's all it was. Yeah. <laughs> the, the creature's eyes weren't really glowing. Right. They were just flashing. It was a gosh light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know the original. I don't know how much you were aware of the original uh, script or anything, but from what I understand, the original idea for Chud, they weren't really going to be monsters. They were going to be more like just uh, mutant people. But then it, they became monsters in the final version of the movie. Well, I think it's all the same. Now, they were mutant people. Sure, but I think really that way. they were going to look more uh, just humanoid as opposed to the monsters. Well, it's cannibalistic humanoid oh, underground dwellers, but uh -huh. they 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 were um, as far as I recall, they actually were derived were. from homeless people living in underground tunnels who were exposed to some you know radioactive waste or some crap like that. Right, right. right? Yeah. Who mutated into these monsters? Oh, do you know what? Um, um, in the initial scene of Chud. Okay, there's a woman walking down the street, right? Yeah. In high heels, right? Mm -hmm. And then a, the, a manhole cover lurches up and a big monster hand comes out and grabs her leg, right? Right. That's me. Oh, really? See, you're also yeah, a judge. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, yes. That was yeah. me. I was down there in the manhole <laughs> and they had a, like a little fog machine down there. <laughs> so that's get... me when that hand when that hand comes up and grabs the woman's leg that was that was my hand very when that needs to be on your credit not only fluffy but you also people need to know you're also a chud i think there's an awesome photo of me down there that i have no idea how to find it man it was taken by this guy whose name i can't remember he was a new york times photographer but he also did he did um like on set photography for various films. I can't remember his name basically because also he like 
turned out to like kind of get with my girlfriend and then oh, i really? didn't like him anymore yeah but um, i guess you want to yeah. um i don't think i have a copy of that anymore but it's an awesome photo of me <clears throat> with my hair all out and i'm wearing a monster arm and i'm just emerging out of a monster you know manhole with all this smoke coming around me but i just haven't seen that photo in years it's a really cool picture. Yeah. It's a lot different. It's weird because uh, I think like, if I would have had a camera when I was, uh, I don't have many pictures of me like in my teens and 20s, but now I have like countless pictures because everyone has a, a camera on your phone, but right. uh, yeah. it's easier to find, I guess. So, yeah, I could just like search on Facebook and then the things will pop up. Yeah, I can't search so easily for this one, but I no, know. No, no. Yeah, it's real picture. Awesome photo. Yeah. It's really great. Mm -hmm. yeah very cool to see well i really <laughs> i really appreciate this and i had a really great time talking to you you're a lot of fun mm -hmm. and i would love to meet you sometime and everyone's gonna get a chance to meet you at the convention this weekend living dead weekend thanks neil i'm sorry you can't make it to living dead weekend but um i hope to meet you again sometime real soon yeah definitely thanks man i really appreciate this right on hey